oftentimes we hear or even talk about addiction as if it is this elusive enemy, something that is working against us. It is this part of us that is bad and negative and evil and destroying our lives. It absolutely looks that way, doesn't it? And it feels that way as well because it's not who we truly are. And it results in us showing up in life in some pretty unfortunate ways, in some ways that are very harmful to us and ways that are very harmful to others. So if you're in a, a traditional recovery program, you probably hear things like my addict and addiction. You know, my addict is uh, waiting in the parking lot, doing push-ups, and it's going to like attack. As soon as you let your guard down, then your addict is going to attack you and come back. And it's like this, this battle happening between who you want to be and your addict and like your addict side and your addiction. We hear a lot of that terminology and I totally get it. I absolutely understand why we speak that way and why it looks that way. And even in, in some areas, why that can be helpful for a short time. However, that's not actually what's going on. So I wanna bring it back to earlier in life where addiction actually starts forming. For most of us, this is something that began a lot sooner than when we started noticing it in bigger ways. We're finding as they study addiction more and more that trauma or adverse childhood experiences are consistently present in those that grow up to have active addiction. We are finding what's going on with the, the brain and the body when we have those adverse childhood experiences or when we have trauma in the mix. We're gonna talk about that here and, and how addiction kind of forms, not the biological component of addiction forming, but as people and more importantly, as children. So for most of us, and you might not have connection to this, this might not resonate with you yet. Uh, you, you may uh, not be at this point in your work or uh, you may be uh, one of the few that has come into addiction in a later stage in life. But for most of us, it does happen through these adverse childhood experiences, which we also can look at as trauma. Now, we have to look at that, and we're only going to go into this briefly. I go into all of this in a lot more depth in my Introduction to Sex Addiction course, as well as um, the what's really going on with addiction course. And, and of course, we talk about this in the Illuminatorium quite a bit as well. But as children, you have to think, you're not an adult when this came into the mix. We're kiddos. And as kids, we are completely dependent on our caregivers. We can do nothing. We're very useless as children. Like we're the worst species. We, we can't even walk, right? Like horses are running on their first day. What are we doing? Uh, being cute, right? I don't know. Anyway, we're completely dependent on our caregivers. It is very literally all about survival when we are young. That is the part of our brain that's <laughs> developed and that is just kind of comes online right away. Survival, make sure I survive. Yes, even as babies, we're not consciously doing this, of course, but we learn behaviors and we learn to adapt in alignment with what we perceive will keep us alive. Perceive, that's a really important part of this. Being that survival is our only priority as children and as babies, it's our top priority always as if the brain is concerned, but without consciousness and without any other development yet, that's where we're living. We're living in this survival state. Anything that we perceive from the point of view of a child to threaten our survival can create trauma. It can be an adverse childhood experience. When that happens in really big ways or in little ways consistently over time, it actually is altering our brain chemistry. We are developing differently than a child who is in a consistently safe, perceived safe, stable environment where all of their needs are met. 
That's not really common. I've never met anyone <laughs> where that has been the case for them. But we'll just say it's possible that someone out there had every need met all of the time and was always in a perceived state of safety and stability. And I hope more and more we're going to see that as more of us grow into healthy adults, right? With that, either really big event or the consistent small events, we adapted in order to feel safe or to feel good or better as children. So we have a combo of things going on here. We have the alteration of our development as a result of these experiences. So we have a different brain actually in the mix where our chemicals shift and change and adapt in order to make us uh, appropriate for our environment. The brain's trying to do us a solid. It's like, oh, you are in a constant state of stress. I'll go ahead and up those chemicals and alter some other chemicals so that you can continue existing in your circumstances. It doesn't have the ability to go like, hmm, sir, this shouldn't be. The circumstances is a precious, beautiful, perfect child. It shouldn't be being treated this way. It should definitely be safe. And I'll go ahead and develop accordingly. No, no, the brain adapts and we adapt as children for that survival. Because we have this alteration of our development and we have a deficit in chemicals and now we're bringing behaviors or substances into the mix to counter that and to feel safe and to feel comforted or to feel better, we now are susceptible for that becoming actually physically compulsive because of that development in the brain and used consistently over time is how addiction comes into the mix. But in the beginning, we engage with these things as a way to comfort ourselves, as a way to feel better or safe or different, which can be plenty, and honestly to survive from the point of view of a child. I have to keep reiterating that because so often we think that we've always been like this, like I've always been an adult and I should have known this and I should have done this and my, you know, no, we're kids when this is going on. Addiction isn't your enemy. Those behaviors or substances were there as your kid self trying to take care of you. And they did help and they did work for a time, which is why we continue to use them. Yeah, it blew up in our faces later, certainly, but it's not an outside elusive evil force that's coming to attack you. It was the best attempt from your child self to care for yourself and to comfort yourself as a young child or at any point in our early lives. Because of all of that altered development that was going on in the brain and the continual use of these things that tie into the reward system, it turned into compulsion and turned into addiction. That's what's going on with that. Honestly, at the, at the beginning, this is your friend. It was your protector. It was your comforter. It was your soother. It was your safety. It was your savior for a time. That's where that begins. When we look at it as a dual force, something that's coming to get me, something that might attack me, something I need to be on guard because of, what are we doing? We're putting ourselves in a space of survival. We are putting ourselves in a sense, a perceived sense of unsafety. There's this thing, this evil thing inside of me that is going to take over. Now we go right back into that old part of the brain, that development that didn't happen quite right, that part where addiction lives, the system where addiction lives in, and now we're putting ourselves there and we're living there. 
that's not conducive to getting sober and staying sober. And it's not conducive to recovery at all. We don't have to like the things that came about as a result of our addiction behavior or the experiences we had during our early life. We don't have to love that stuff. Well, in time we do. <laughs> You have to kick it with us in the Illuminatorium to learn more about that and how to do that. But we have to come into acceptance of those things and not carry them out as if they're here to attack us. The idea of that outside force or that inside force that's coming for you is going to totally sabotage your recovery. So before we move forward, I just, I want to invite you and encourage you to try to have some compassion for yourself, for that younger version of yourself that did the best that they could, honestly, like we're kids, what are we going to do? Uh, be like, hey, uh, I know that you're harming me as my caregiver. Could I go to therapy, please? Because this is going to affect me later on in life. And I've kind of got some big plans that I want to do as a human. Uh, and this isn't helping. So could we get some, some uh, healing for this now? Thank you. Yeah, no, that wasn't happening, right? We ate sugar. We masturbated. We went into fantasy. Uh, we did anything that we could that felt better. And we continued doing that over time. So have some compassion. That doesn't excuse our behavior. We're going to have to deal with that. We have to take responsibility. This isn't our fault. And what we do about it is our responsibility, right? Please have some compassion. Please know that the addiction started out as your friend, maybe your only friend, your savior and your comforter. That doesn't mean we have to keep engaging with it because we're adults now. We have new tools now. We're going to talk about those later on in this little course. I just want to end this little section by saying it's imperative to stop the dual thinking because of the biological effect it's having and keeping you in the part of the process, our biological process that actually fuels addiction. It's not helping you to think about it that way. It's not helping you to think of something going to attack you. In order to heal, we have to have safety and that starts with you. We're gonna talk about one of the most important parts for the biological component to all of this in the next section.